your car. And I'm coming right now. Are you ready? Uh, that doesn't happen. That when we're not ready, the enemy comes. And the Lord is saying on purpose, he can come into our situation like a thief when we're not ready. And it says, uh, the people are saying what? Peace and safety. And by the way, that will be happening at the end of the age. And a man will arise that will give the world peace and safety. And we know the um, book of Daniel says that uh, they'll sign a covenant of peace with Israel. And you know, all of the presidents of America are trying to do it. And they're all failing. And I'll tell you what, they all will fail. And even if, unless um, Vladimir Putin is the Antichrist, he'll fail too. Because the thing is, they'll become a man who will bring peace to the Middle East. And he'll, there'll, there'll be a covenant of peace signed. And all the nations are crying peace and safety. And there will be peace and safety for a season. And, every, and, and, and those that are truly discerning, by the way, the watchmen of God, will be saying, this man is not the world's saviour. This is the Antichrist. Be warned. Because he'll come and he'll fix up our economy. He'll fix up all the problems in the world economy. He's going to fix up all the world problems with the wars. He'll fix up the things in the Middle East. He's going to like be everyone's hero. But the thing is, there'll come a day at the three and a half year point, the mask will come off and you'll see that he's truly the man of wickedness. But the thing is, before that day comes, those that are not slumbering will see and discern and they'll be warning. But we'll be like Noah. We're warning everyone, oh man, the judgment's coming. And they're going to laugh at us. They're going to mock us. They're going to say, hey, this guy's really good. How can you say he's evil? He does good things. Okay, so that's the scenario at the end, end time. But in history, it happens as well. Because good is not always God. And so what it's saying here is that they come into a place, peace and security. And if peace and security is your major goal, then you are a prime candidate for the slumbering spirit. However, if obeying the words of Jesus is your primary goal, then you'll be the watchman that is not caught by the thief in the night. Do you understand that? Because some Christians think that the goal of Christianity is peace and security and blessing Amen. and feeling good. No, no, no. Your goal is obey Jesus, whatever Amen. he says. Amen. And so even if you have to sacrifice peace and security and, and you have to lay down that which is comfortable, I want to obey God. Amen. Now that personality will not slumber and will not be caught by the enemy. Amen. Suddenly, like labor pains on a pregnant woman. I know all about that. <laughs> I really suffered. My wife helped me through it. But... <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's go back to the book of Revelation. Your childbirth is really stressful for husbands. Now, Jesus says something that's really interesting and even encouraging. Verse 4. Yet, now Jesus has been hitting these slumberers and these dead Christians and these compromised Christians and half-hearted obedience people. And now he says this. Yet you've got a few people. This is why the church wasn't fully dead. There were still a few people that were there in Sardis who had not soiled their clothes. To soil your clothes means you've defiled your clothes. They've been defiled. They've become unclean. Which means most of the church, because of compromise, had been soiling their clothes. They've, they've defiled themselves spiritually. However, there's a few that were not slumbering. They were not dead. They were awakened ones, and they had not soiled their clothes. They're wearing the white robes. In other words, they're pure and they're holy. And the Lord Jesus has said, there's still a few of you there that are doing this. It's kind of like you go into the desert, you know, the really dry desert. I don't know if you've ever been to a desert. I've, I've been through the television set to deserts many times. Uh, when I was in Tibet, I went to some deserts in Tibet. You know, it's, it's, it's like there is nothing green. It's just dirt and rocks. That's it. And then you suddenly see in the middle of the desert all of this dryness. And you suddenly see, oh, can you see those flowers? There's these beautiful flowers over there. Amazing. You've got to look really hard to find them. But they're there, these beautiful flowers in the desert. Go, wow. And then and suddenly you're walking around and looking around, and there's this tree. You know, you ever seen those photos? All desert, one tree there. You know, like there's this one. Well, that's what these Christians were like. They were like the flowers in the desert. There were some of them still there. The faithful ones, the ones that had not allowed themselves in a prosperous time, in a prosperous city, that not allowed themselves to slumber. They're like the watchmen on the wall. They say, we're going to watch over the back gate. You know, we're not going to, the enemy can attack any time. 
We know everything's going good at the moment, but the enemy could attack. And so Jesus praises them. He says, you know, you, you've not soiled your clothes. You've not defiled yourself, which means that actually everybody else had soiled their clothes. He says, um, these ones will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. So Jesus is seeing this few, and I want to be one of those few. What about you? I'd like us all to be one of the overcoming churches, but in the world, how about if Lions Royal House of Prayer is like the flowers in the wilderness church? You know, We're like the oasis in the wilderness. There's all dry, dead wilderness out there, but there's this oasis. There's living water there, and there's all of these beautiful trees that people can find shade in, and all the people that are dying of heat and exhaustion and, and thirst in the wilderness, they see the oasis, and they come running to you. Because there's life there in a dead place. There's life. I want to be that Christian. In a dry, dead, broken world, I want to be the river of life person. I want to be the, the beautiful flowers. I want to be the tree that people can come to and they can find covering and protection. That's what I want to be. But to be that, you need to be like these few that refuse to soil their clothes. I will not be defiled. I will not tolerate sin in my life. I'm not going to compromise with sin. When God asks me to do something, I will fully obey. Even if it takes 30 years, I'm going to keep going and keep going. I'm going to fully obey. Amen. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to be the one that's going to slumber. Amen. These, this is not, the few were there. They weren't slumbering. They were awake and they were doing all that Christ had asked them to do. And they're refusing to compromise with sin in any way. Amen. Reminds me, you know, why, you know, how do you stay tuned into God and become one of these people? In, in the, wilderness, the wilderness of prosperity. Because, you know, prosperity can sometimes be a curse. That's right, yeah. Poverty can sometimes be a blessing. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes poverty in the natural will cause us, you know, blessed are the poor, for they will receive the good news. Poverty can be a blessing because why? It makes you hungry, it makes you thirsty, and then you start crying out to God. When you're prosperous, it's like I heard... Um, a, a teaching by John Bevere, and he'd actually he'd be going to South Korea for many years. Every year, several times, he'd go to South Korea, and he'd be speaking. And he's, so over 30 years, he's been ministering into that nation. And he said, like, this is 10 years ago, he said this, so it's worse now. South Koreans, listen. Because South Korea has a danger of becoming this church. You look like you're alive, lots of people there. So you're running around, feeding your bellies, slumbering. Okay. So he says this. He said, when I first went to South Korea, and it's like 20, 30 years ago, there's such an amazing hunger for God. We would do seminars. The young people were hungry. The old people were hungry. Everyone was hungry. Go to children's church. They're hungry. He didn't say that, but I thought I'd put that in. <laughs> Everyone is so hungry. We want to hear from God. We want more of God. We are desperate for God. The reason was, is that as a nation, they were coming out of poverty. That's right, yeah. As a nation, they'd been so hungry in the natural that it stirred up a spiritual hunger. And they were so desperate for God. And there was that generation that knew what it was to suffer and not to have. And they're so hungry, they pray in the prayer mountain all night. They travel like hours to go to a prayer mountain so that they could pray for three or four days. I was so hungry for God. And he says he can remember that generation and, and you go there and there's a hunger. And then he saw over the space of 30 years the hunger is starting to die. And he said, now when I go to South Korea, yeah, the old ones, there's, some of them are still hungry. You get one person here, one person there. They're like the flowers in the wilderness. I added that in. He didn't say that. But the flowers in the wilderness people, you know. He said, you do find there's these individual people and individual groups. They're still hungry for God. But he said, when I go now, because I used to be, everyone's like this, listening to me when I'm speaking. Writing notes, listening. He says, now when I go, this is what all of the youth are doing. <laughs> it's okay if you're, if you're writing notes. <laughs> see what's happened and he said this he said you go to South Korea now and all the young people they've got all the best shoes Nike, Adidas they've got really nice clothes you can see all the makeup on the girls really beautified and everything <laughs> and you go outside and they've got the best cars they've got good cars, good houses the churches are, are brilliant he used to go to some churches when he went like 30 years ago, and they're very humble churches. 
humble people with humble clothes coming in. But now it's all, everyone's wealthy. The kids have got everything they want. And he said, you see fat Koreans. He said, we never saw fat Koreans before. They're all skinny. <laughs> it's because of McDonald's. McDonald's did it. <laughs> I saw something on Facebook, by the way, and it said, uh, you know, why do you wear a UFC t-shirt when you should wear a KFC t-shirt? <laughs> you know, uh, UFC is United Fight Club. You know, they're the, the radical gladiator fight people. Yeah. And KFC is, anyway. <laughs> But he literally said that that, 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 that in Korea, he said, you could see they've lost their hunger. That's right, yeah. The young generation, the older generation, it says, that you get individual groups that have got hunger, but the, the young people are full of the world. The world has filled them up. Right. Clothes and food and money and security, they have not had to struggle and suffer and fight to get ahead. Because mum and dad give them everything. It's like... Feed me. You know, the little birds, feed me, but now they're big birds. <laughs> and, and he said that they've not learned how to suffer and struggle and fight to overcome. That's right. And now the church of South Korea is becoming Sardis. Mm. Yeah, I'm just prophesying. So you South Koreans don't go that road. Be the flowers in the wilderness. Amen. Hallelujah. It says, these ones that are the flowers in the wilderness, they will walk with me. How would you like that? They're going to have intimacy with me. That's what Jesus is saying. They're going to have intimacy. They're going to have a relationship with me. These other guys, they're sleeping. You know, it's really hard to have a relationship with someone when you're sleeping. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I want to share my heart with you. <laughs> it doesn't work. When you're awake and you can walk together. I want to walk with Jesus. I was just at the HIM conference, by the way, and I was going to get up. I wanted to prophesy something right at the end. I, uh, I didn't do it, though. But um, anyway, I'll tell you, and we'll do it here. And it's just like the one thing I wanted to cry out, the one thing was, Jesus, walk amongst us. Amen. Jesus, walk amongst us. Amen. Jesus, I want to walk with you. Amen. Jesus, I don't want to just be behind you. I want to be with you. Let's... I want to talk with you. Jesus, I want to be in a Jesus church where Jesus is walking amongst us and we walk with Jesus. And by the way, when we walk out the door, Jesus comes with us and we take him to work. Yeah, that's right. So it's okay to go to work. Let's go to work with Jesus and work for Jesus. Right. Amen? Amen? These ones will walk with me. These ones that do not slumber. These ones that do not soil their clothes. These ones that are hungry for me. Because they're hungry. You know what? If you're hungry for a relationship with someone, you know, you know remember when the, the boy falls in love with the girl. You know, that's, that story. And he can't stop calling her on the phone. It's like, I've got to call again. You know, can't. I've got to send another text message. Because you know, I love this person. You know? And it's like, I can't wait to see them. All night I can't sleep because I can't wait to see them. I'm going to see them tomorrow. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because you're hungry in love with this person and you just can't wait. And then you do everything you can. It's like you will put aside everything. It's like, oh, I'm not going to go to work today because I want to be with that person. Okay. By the way, don't try to do that too often. <laughs> but you know what? You put aside everything else. You will find a way to be with that person. Yeah. And it's amazing. When people start to move into spiritual slumber, they find a way not to be with that person. That's right. They find a way not to come to church. That's right. They find a way not to be in the prayer meeting. That's right. They find a way not to be with brothers and sisters in the Lord having fellowship. Mm. They'll, they'll desperately. And so they've constantly got excuses why they can't be there. That's because right. they're finding a way not to be. That's right. But when you fall in love with Jesus, remember first commandment, first priority. When you're really hungry for him, mm. you will make sacrifices of everything else. Oh, yeah. I don't care if I miss out on a day's wages. I want to be with Jesus. I don't care if I miss that movie. I can actually watch it later. They will walk with me. What a promise. They will receive the white clothes. So he's saying, you, you have not soiled your clothes. I'm going to give you spiritual clothes that are pure white. I'm going to give you the, the clothes of righteousness and holiness that come from heaven. Above and beyond the fact that you and the natural. Because you know, as much as we try not to sin, we all make mistakes. Yeah, like No one's perfect without sin. These guys weren't perfect without sin. They would have made mistakes. They would have lost their temper when they shouldn't. Have. But the thing is, they were being faithful and not soiling themselves with sin. And the thing was, now Jesus is saying, on top of your own righteousness, I give you my righteousness. 
I'm going to give you the white robes. I will never blot out his name from the book of life. But I will acknowledge his name before my father and before the angels. This is powerful. This is a promise. There is a book called the book of life. And in fact, um, it's written throughout scripture about the book of life. God has books. Did you know? Angels write in there. And there's names in the book of life. When you get born again, you're committed to follow Jesus, your name gets written into the book of life. See, in ancient times, each city had a book, and the citizens of that city, their names were written in the book. You're a citizen of our city. When you become a citizen of the kingdom of God, you come into the kingdom of God, your name is written in the book of life. Amen. My name is there. I, I pray to God, your names are there. Most of your names are. If they're not, we can fix that up and get it written in there uh, before we have lunch. <laughs> so, but, he, but, but listen to this. Your name will not be blotted out. It means your name is in the book. And if you continue in faithfulness and you don't slumber and die spiritually, if you don't compromise with sin, if you don't die spiritually, your name will not be blotted out. But what happens to the rest of the church? Their names will be blotted out from the book of life. What does that mean in regards to eternal salvation? Again, I come from the camp that I believe there's a place you can come to. Not easy. You don't just make a couple of mistakes and your name gets blotted out. You know, um, the, uh, Jesus isn't like that. But the thing is, there comes a place where you continue to walk in rejection of Christ and His ways. And when you're spiritually dead, you're spiritually dead. Your name gets blocked out of the book of life. Mm. <clears throat> Goes on, it says, and on top of not blocking out your name, because your name is now, Jesus knows your name. You know, Wow, that's... So and so, you know, that's that's my one. He said, he says, I'm going to I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to go to the angels. Here's Jesus. Hey, Papa God, you see that guy? That's Theo. I love Theo, and Theo walks with me. And he's like one of those flowers in the wilderness. He's like the oasis in the wilderness, Christian. You know, he's he's alive in me. He walks with me. He talks with me. He is my friend. Father, see Theo. Hey, angels. I want to tell you about Theo. Sorry, Theo. It's like, <laughs> don't want to embarrass you or anything. But, you know, how, how would you like Jesus to grab your name and start going, Papa God, I want to talk to you about Singil. Have you seen Singil? Have you seen his faithfulness? Have you seen the sacrifices he's making because he wants to follow me radically? Have you seen that? I've seen it. Hey, angels, look at Singil. That's what it says here. Something very interesting in the life of Jesus, it's in the Gospels, he said this. He says, if you deny my name before men, I'll deny your name before the Father. But if you do not deny my name before men, I will not deny your name before the Father. Mm. You know, those people, I don't know Jesus. Or you live in such a way, sometimes you might come to church and say, I know Jesus. And you go to work and you pretend you don't. Because when you're around the Christians, it's easy to say, I'm a Christian. But when you go to work, it's like, I don't want anyone to know that I'm a Christian. Embarrassing, you know. They'll laugh at me. But Jesus says, if you deny my name, I'll deny yours before the Father, you know. And again, I'm not saying if you do it once, then, you know, you're going to hell. I'm not saying that. <laughs> like, that would be scary if Christianity was like that. You make one mistake, you know. Like, I'll be going to hell every day. Um, there's the grace of God, amen. The grace of God is over this. The love of God is over this. But, you know, every day I want, the father, I want Jesus going to the Father going, look at Glenn today, you know. Hey, angels, look at Glenn today. I don't want him going, hey, Father, don't look at Glenn today. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's have a look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 33. Exodus first. 32, verse 33. Okay. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out from my book.
same. I'm not talking about a single sin. We're not talking about a single mistake. But it's people that continue in unrepented sin, which includes the sin of spiritual slumber. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled before his presence. And there was no place for them. And then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now this is the end of the age, the great uh, white throne judgment of God. And if your name is in the book of life, then even though you might have sinned or whatever, and, and, and there's those things, they get blotted out. Your sins get blotted out of the other books. And your name gets put into the book of life. You are now have eternal life as a gift. And, and, and so you can move into being with the Lord for eternity but if your name is not in the book of life, then you're going to hell. It's called the lake of fire. There's Hades. That's the hell that you wait in. And then the final second death, because, you know, you'll die two times.